by Stephanie Brennanson. She's the Graduate Studies and Scholarly Communication Librarian here at FIU. In that role, she promotes research skills and services to support graduate research and teaching. She plays a key role in the library's outreach efforts concerning scholarly communication and intellectual property rights and educate in the university community about scholarly publication before. And so seeing that, I should probably point out that the New York Times is a sponsor. We did just steal their articles for this, so copyright <laughs> under control. <laughs> Stephanie has focused her scholarship on the areas of academic librarianship, research services, and information literacy for 30 plus years, and served as a library instruction coordinator at FIU's Green Library from 1996 to 2002. Outside of FIU, she's also an adjunct professor for the <laughs> University of South Florida School of Information Graduate Program in the University of Maryland University College in their Graduate School of Management and Technology. She has earned her MSLS, which I believe is a Master of Science in Library Science, at Columbia University in New York and her bachelor's at the State University of New York at Sedona. So I'll turn it over to today's moderator, Stephanie Brennan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to ask before I start talking or filling in the blanks, um, how many of you have read the article? Do you feel like you could give me give a summary for the group um, of what the article is basically talking about? Anyone? I won't force you, but if you if you'd like to. No? OK. Well, essentially, it's talking about what our government is doing to move forward some initiatives pertaining to making research publicly available. So the article itself looks at um, some of the things that have been going on for the last few years. And um, the two things at the top that are in green, those are um, identifying some legislation that has actually gone through that um, is currently um, on the books in this country. And the one that is probably the one at the top of the list, the Consolidated Appropriations Act, that establishes the NIH funding, is probably the most well known because a lot of what is happening now and what has been happening in between is sort of looking at the success of that model. Uh, then um, there came uh, another legislative initiative in 2010, and that was really sort of asking for, um, to come up with some ideas on how to make this happen. Uh, but it really, as, as the, um, it really didn't give the specifics of where to go with, with the uh, action of, of actually making it, uh, making these things uh, available to you. So what, what ended up happening in two, 2011 and 2012 is that Congress came out with a, a couple of additional bills trying to move forward some legislation and those both um, did not get passed. They just sort of sat there. What has happened though in the last year since your article is an act has been passed called the Fair Access to Science and Technology Research Act. And this is the first um, act that really, it looks like it has some legs, like it's going to make it to the finish line, maybe. And essentially what it's going to do is require federal agencies that have research budgets of 100 million or more to, pro to provide to the public online access to the research articles that are uh, written as a result of the research that's done with their grant money. So when they provide grant money to um, uh, a researcher, like someone here at FIU, for example, then they uh, expect that the article that's, articles that are written as a result of that research are made available publicly. And in this, um, in this legislation, they're saying the research would be available within six months. In the um, NIH, it was 12 months. And what they're trying to do is cut down the amount of time between when the actual article is published and when it is made available to the public in an open access manner, so meaning everybody has access to it. So they're trying to cut down on that time frame. What's really um, important about this uh, legislation is that it has stronger language than the other two that sort of sort of failed um, on reuse rights. And it increases the types of ways that people can share what you can do with, with the um, 
materials that are put out there. And it also starts looking at the data side of the picture, that not just the research article, but the data behind the article. They're trying to also look at ways to make the data available in an open way as well. <coughs> and also for people to be able to utilize it. Um, also for computers to be able to search it. So there are all these levels of access that this legislation is putting forward that is different than the ones that have been happening in between. And probably are some of the reasons why those fell off. The Research Works Act actually wanted to just get rid of everything, but that um, didn't have a lot of um, backing and everyone pulled away because as as we talk today um, if I have a chance to point out where the where things are going and what this whole movement is about um, it's just open access is becoming more and more uh, a part of the culture of research and I think that they realized that they were fighting a losing battle so that was probably another reason why the Research Works Act got um, kind of pushed away now, if you're particularly curious about this act, um, you certainly can find it um, on the web. And if you want to make your voice heard, um, as in anything in, in, uh, in the US, you can contact your legislators. Now, you can contact your um, senators. Um, and I just put the Florida ones here. So if we have out-of-state students, um, we, can, we can help you find who your legislators are. And also the US representatives for Florida, you would have to go to the map, uh, this great map that shows you who is your legislator in your district. Um, but essentially, you would be writing to them, asking them to support the faster bill. And there's some great um, talking points on the Alliance for Taxpayer Access site. And um, it's just an opportunity to be a part of the democratic system and talk about something that's important to you. So um, if you don't get these uh, now, don't hesitate to email me. I'll be happy to provide you with the information that you need. Any questions? So that the faster bill is not passed yet? No, it's still in that, that period where hearings are being done and people from variety of interests are speaking. I mean, obviously, publishers are speaking, and um, students and li libraries and researchers are speaking to the needs. Because I think that they're looking at, um, for example, the NIH uh, bill, the one that was originally passed. NIH has been so um, successful in putting forth that legislation, in having the articles being published in PubMed, which I think gets over a million hits a day, which is a remarkable amount of hits any day for articles that are published there. So it's pretty, um, they've already shown that they know how to make it happen. And one of the, um, one of the things is to try and see if we can um, you know, make the legislation tight enough. I think they want to make sure that the implementation is going to work out smoothly. So there's a lot, of, a lot of interest there. Now, the legislation is important for a lot of reasons. Um, let me give you one more piece to this puzzle, and then we can talk a little bit more. Um, the White House came out in um, not, not long after the FASTER Act was put through. Um, that with a, a directive. This was last, Feb this February passed. Um, they directed all federal agencies with more, now does this seem like something we were just talking about? With more than a hundred million in R&D expenditures to develop plans to make the published research or federally funded research freely available to the public within one year of publication and requiring researchers to better account for and manage the digital data resulting from federally funded scientific research. So this sort of sounds like what I was just talking about in FASTER, right? Does it sound pretty similar? This directive is happening now. So in fact, agencies through uh, in the federal government, I think there are about 24 agencies that fit the, that fit the 100 million plus um, model. But actually, I heard uh, Michael Stebbins talking yesterday, and he was saying that several smaller agencies are following the same plan right now. So they, these agencies were tasked with coming up with a plan on how they would make um, 
make sure that the articles written as a result of research would ha have the same sort of open access um, availability as the NIH uh, model that we see. And then they take it a step further of asking for them to also think about how to deal with the data situation. Because the data is very important to other researchers and taking the, this research and moving it and um, to the next level, another researcher could use it to do some additional um, way, use that, re that data in another way. So the whole point is to make it available and other people to utilize that, that knowledge. Um, any questions? Yes. What's the specific, um, like, what's the specific rule on the Appropriations Act of 2008, which requires researchers uh, financed by the NIH? It, do they have to be fully funded by? Is it fully federally funded researchers that are getting? Very good question. Um, these are these are researchers who are usually um, at a university, like your faculty members here. They apply for an NIH, NIH grant. They get it, they do the research, they write an article as a result of it. So it primarily happens in the universities, but also research institutes and other types of um, institutions that are eligible for that kind of funding. So it's not, it, it's a part of the, it actually becomes a part of the academic process. Does that answer your question? Um, sort of. The, my question, I guess, really relies on if, let's say, a researcher needs a grant for a project. Mm -hmm. Is he getting the full uh, amount from NIH, or is it different grants from different? So, in other words, if there's different interests, right? So, if a private uh, publisher gives a grant and there's the NIH gives a grant, mm -hmm. there should be a distribution of the decision on that, right? Well. I think that if you take an NIH grant that you have to follow their rule no matter what. But there are situations where the information cannot be made public. There are times when there's um, classified information involved in the research that's done. And that's, that has a different sort of um, outcome. They don't make it open access. Um, and I, I have to be honest with you, I'm not certain about uh, the pe that piece of the of the equation when it is something that could be sensitive. Um, so you know, just like there are classified things in government, research sometimes has has um, situations where there's classified information involved that just cannot be shared, and that it, that's handled differently. But also, you know, when when research is done, and there are, you know, a, a researcher takes a lot of um, <coughs> care to make sure that the subjects are not identifiable. So I'm not talking about those sensitive things, but other things that might be sensitive in research. That sort of makes sense? I guess so. Do you have anything specific you're thinking of? Yeah, like if I'm a researcher and I, I need you know, $100,000 for a certain project with a research team, and NIH only funds, do, do they fund the whole portion or do they fund only a small portion, and I have to get other grants to fill up the rest of that? I think that would depend. Do you want to speak to that, please? Oh, no, I was just going to say it depends. Like, I mean, the NIH can award you as much of a grant as they like, depending on, uh, uh, you know, what is it? Your, uh, Proposal? Yeah, like your need or your purpose. Mm -hmm. And then if whatever is left, you can look for other people to uh, sponsor you. Or not, not sponsor you, but, like, you know, fund you. Other funding, yeah. But I, I do know that in the grant, when you accept the grant, it, it does say what you have to do with your research. And this is a piece of the puzzle, is to make it available um, through PubMed. But as I, does anyone else know of situations that fit into his concern? Anybody? OK. So it's not, you know, there are situations where it, there are exceptions to the rule. But for the most part, um, it's been very successful. No questions? OK. Um, and it's important, one of the pieces of this puzzle, I'm going to get into going beyond us, but one of the pieces of, of the open access um, movement is that more, more people are interested in getting their hands on this research than just researchers. I mean, obviously, the researchers are one of the main um, users of this data and all the articles. But 
you know, a patient who's looking for a treatment. I mean, when somebody is having uh, a health crisis, they want to go out there and be able to do some searching or have someone they know do some searching for them. And having that material out there makes it more accessible. Small businesses, they don't have the kinds of resources that universities have to go find information about something that they're working on. Um, so, you know, having this access is very important. Someone anywhere in the world could be interested in global warming, and there could be a wonderful article talking about global warming that was based on research. And the way things go now, there all of these articles are behind a paywall. How many of you have done research and you click to find an article and you can't get to it? It doesn't let you in. Okay. Um, there are lots of different reasons why that happens. Um, you know, universities can only buy so much. We have limited budgets, although we buy huge numbers of, of journals and spend millions of dollars on them. But we could never have everything. And um, when you think of how much we have and other parts of the world where there can be a research institute that can only, uh, and, and I actually have been reading about this, there are institutes around the world that they can only buy a fraction of the journals in their field, sometimes one journal in their field. And when you, you don't have that kind of those resources, having, you know, moving forward in your work is very difficult. I was, I was listening to someone talking about um, how when she's doing research, it's that minute that she finds the article and it, it's in the middle of something she's thinking about when it really applies to what she's working on. And, if it's not available freely, she has to ask for someone, like an interlibrary loan, ask for someone to order it for her. And here, we, we have very quick service with interlibrary loans. But in other um, parts of the world, they don't. And so they could, she could wait a week before she gets what she needs. So it's, um, it's an opportunity to make, uh, to make information available worldwide in a more um, on a needs ba need, needed basis. You don't have to wait for it or have to go to an institution like FIU to have access, because we are quite lucky in what we have access to. And another group of people that doesn't have access to this information, um, the way it is in the traditional sense, are policymakers. And I mean this globally. All over the world, there are people who are making policy for their um, country, for their town, and having access to information that would help them to make good water policy or whatever the policies are they're working on. Um, this would just open up all kinds of avenues for information that they just do not have access to now. So open access has been little by little improving. The legislation we're seeing here is about publicly funded research. And that's probably one of the easiest things to talk about because we pay tax, we pay money. That's why I, I had that taxpayer um, site that talks about FASTER. Because our, our tax money goes to these agencies. They pay for the research. And then we're normally pay, we're paying to get our hands on it in those articles. And I'll show you in a couple of minutes on economic model that kind of shows you how kind of crazy the situation is. Um, a couple of, of um, areas in the world that are really moving quickly on this are the UK, the research councils in, of the UK. Um, they have, since April 2013, have been moving in the same direction as we are, except they're actually <coughs> instituting it at this point. And they go a little further in that all of the federally funded research is a part of the process of making the information OA. And then um, the European Commission, um, uh, they have a huge study that they did and came up with um, a program called Horizon 2020 that will start from 2014 to 2020 and that their goal is to make all of this research available in open access. So we're talking about um, all of the European Union countries and there are many other countries that are, are discussing it that are celebrating Open Access Week as we are and um, trying to move forward in this area. So it's a very interesting movement and it's happening worldwide. It's not just right here. I think um, the worldwide piece comes from the fact that the access is so um, poor 
outside of the larger countries that we're talking about, the more developed countries. So uh, that kind of need is very much there, and hopefully the countries that are doing the most research, um, the U.S. is, is the highest, uh, has the highest research dollars in the world, um, hopefully making our, the, the results of that research available. Any questions? Yes. You mentioned all the money FIE spends on all the journals that we have access to. Yes. Um, should open access legislation move forward with any of the articles that we're paying for now become free and we'd be saving money? Or do you think most of those articles are, are not funded by entirely? That's a great question, and I think that you know that's one of the pieces of the the publishers worrying. Um, I would say that it's very possible that many of them will become open access, and because um, right now they're saying that about from 2011, about 50 percent of the research, scientific research done in 2011 is already um, open access. So we're seeing it happen little by little. It's already happening. But there are all kinds of models of how to pay for open access. And um, in some cases, uh, it will affect publishers in, in some way. Um, I think that they're all scrambling. I, obviously, you know, nobody's there to take down the publishing industry. But scholarly publishing is not the major publishing that's done in the world. It's a small part of the publishing. But in any case, it is a concern of publishers, and they're trying to find a way to do it. Some of the idea of the embargoes is based on keeping the, the articles um, published in the journals as they always have been. So the article would come out, and you'd have to wait six months before it would become OA. Right now, we're seeing mostly 12-month embargoes. But uh, they vary. There are some embargoes that are longer. But that, those embargoes, one, that's one of the pieces of making um, a concession to keep the publishers uh, using the same model that they've been using. Uh, so that's just one of the pieces to the puzzle. So yes, I do think we're going to see more and more of this. And how it affects our budgets might, it might affect our budgets or we may be paying someone else to make it happen, not the publishers that we're paying now. That might be different. So it's a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of changes. Yes? I can't hear you. <coughs> Could you speak up? What about the quality of the research? Maybe you can in Europe spend less money, but they have better quality. Oh, actually, the amount of research has nothing to do with the quality. I mean, we just have more research dollars. So the quality of the research um, obviously is important no matter where it's done. So, but it isn't based on, you know, that it's here. It's happening all over the world, and it's just that there, isn't as much, there aren't as many resources for people who are doing the research um, out there. So OA is a way to make that research more available to them. Um, does that answer what you're, the point you're trying to make? Or? I see what you're saying. It's not that the money, that the most, the best research is done here. Is that what you're trying to say? That it's really not a value judgment about the best research being done here. It's the fact that the most money is spent here. That's what I was trying to say, not the, not the quality. The quality of the research is, is judged by the, by the academic community, when, whether they read it, whether they cite it. And that can happen from any, anywhere in the world. So. We're talking about getting access for everybody, including the research in other places. And how the research is, is judged has to do with, when it's published, has to do with peer review, because the peer review system decides what is published, at least today. That's the system that we use that um, helps to decide whether an article is um, ready for publication. Does that make? We sort of on the, so I'm, we're not really talking about 
good research or bad research. We're just talking about the results of research being out there. And, um, and actually, that's a, a, one of the pieces that, is, that they're talking about in terms of transforming the peer review system that is, is there now, is maybe if it was more open peer review, you would get um, a, wider, um, a wider input on how, how the quality of an article is or the research that was done behind an article. So um, that's, that's sort of another piece to the puzzle. But it does come into question about open access, definitely, because not all open access vehicles have as high quality as others. And that's been debated in the, in the, uh, in the news very recently when someone uh, put an article uh, in, actually had an article published um, in, actually, it was accepted for publication in many or, uh, open access journals, including some that were well known. And then they did an expose in science about a week ago saying that, um, you know, calling into question the quality of the journals that were publishing the research article, which was a bogus article. So it was sort of like a sting operation. But there were problems with the sting operation, so I'm not going to go there unless that's really what we want to talk about today. But um, it's definitely a question. Quality is always a question. Any other questions? So essentially, I was talking about um, the, uh, the cost of, of research. And one of the pieces is this paradox of 1.2 million articles are given to publishers for free each year. So you, I'm not sure you're aware that when, when faculty are doing research and they publish an article, they give the article to the publishers. And then we have to buy them back from the publishers. There's something kind of weird about that, because our own faculty are writing these articles, and then we have to go and pay for the article from a publisher. Um, the prices for journals have really risen um, ex immensely, four times faster than inflation in the last two decades. So the prices have gone through the roof. These are just some examples of how much we, we pay for journals. <clears throat> They're pretty, uh, pretty amazing. There are actually journals that cost uh, the price of a kind of nice car, you know, in the 30,000s. And so when you, when you have to buy these kinds of things for accreditation, it starts building. And um, there's a point where sometimes you have to say, hold on, we got to get rid of some, we can't keep up all of these journal uh, subscriptions. In fact, Harvard University, everybody knows Harvard, right? What, what do we expect from Harvard? That's right, they can pay for all of them. But actually, the, they, uh, an, a letter went out to faculty this year saying we can't do that anymore. And um, they understand now that not everything is going to be purchased by the libraries any longer. They cannot afford it. So when Harvard can't afford it, then you're thinking, whoa, what about the rest of us? You know, we don't have endowments like Harvard. Um, but this is a piece of the, of the equation that we're seeing. And Harvard was one of the first universities, um, uh, there was a group of them, to actually create what they call an open access mandate. And they're asking all their faculty to deposit their research papers in their repository so um, anybody can have access to it. There, there are little bells and whistles to that. There is also a waiver that a, 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 an author can take if they really want to publish in a non-OA um, publication that will not allow them to uh, deposit in, in their own repository. But you can see that things are changing. When they, when they threw that out, um, we, we all knew that uh, we're seeing definitely a change in the picture of how we, we access our information. Now, I'm, I'm not an economist, but I'm going to give you sort of the a Mickey Mouse version of how economy works, and then you'll see where I'm going with this. Um, for example, the steel makers produce steel, and they sell it to the uh, automakers, OK? And then the automakers obviously give them money for it. This is the normal market economy. And then the automakers make cars for consumers, and then consumers pay them to um, buy them. Now, this is all 
built on a supply and demand kind of model where steel makers don't make too much to um, you know, too much steel knowing how much the automakers might need. And the automakers don't make too many cars knowing what com consumers are um, interested in. And so it all works. You know, you, never see, you don't see too many cars on the lot at the end of the year. They deliberately have a plan of how to sell those at a smaller price, still making a profit. And it, it all sort of works out. Well, this economy that is working, that's happening with the publishing of articles is different. Um, it's a gift economy, at least that's what we're calling it. Um, the author gives the article to the publisher, and, the pub and sometimes the author has to pay the publisher. There are sometimes fees that they have to pay. And then the author isn't paid by the publisher. They don't get anything. Author, the faculty who write scholarly articles do not get paid for them. They might get a reward through promotion and tenure. They may do it through a grant. We were talking about grants before. They get um, you know, a reputation for their work and prestige for their work, but that's it. They're paid by the university they work for, and that's the money that they get. They're paid to do the research. Now, the next piece to that puzzle is that the publisher gives us the uh, publications, but of course we have to pay them for them. And this, the publisher seems to be getting most of everything in this equation. Um, everyone else is giving. And so this, what's interesting about it is this part, the author's environment, has sort of been a very, um, and sort of, sort of a safe harbor. They're not really aware of what's going on in this part, and so as those prices were going up and up and up, most faculty weren't seeing that, that we were being stretched. And um, in the recent years when people would go to the to a department and say, we've got to cut down our serials budget because we just can't meet those needs anymore, authors began to see, you know, there's something going on here. Now I want to throw one more piece into this equation, and that is the peer reviewers. Peer reviewers are also faculty members who uh, work for, uh, do peer review for certain journals. And they also just get prestige or reputation for doing the peer review, but they don't get any money. They give that service also to publishers. So, you know, there's a very interesting dynamic going on here, and this has been um, a, real, a real problem. Yes? If the authors, if, the authors didn't give, if they didn't give the article, right? Well, that's a very interesting question. I think that the tradition of scholarly publishing, which started like in the 17th century, has always been that researchers do their work. They want to make it available so people all see it. And it's usually, I think, in the earlier times, it usually started with scholarly societies. So they made their material available and shared with each other. Um, but over the years, that has grown and grown. And then in the 20th century, the publishers really became very strong in the kind of, like we're talking about their prices going up, up, up. That really happened. Um, in, the, in the 20th century. And interestingly, the internet was probably the most, um, put the most challenge. At first, I think they thought that was going to be a wonderful thing. And, and I think we all think it's a wonderful thing. But they, I don't think they were seeing how it might transform their, their um, businesses. So now we're all, you know, I agree with you, that is a possibility. But I don't know. You'd have to, I would, I would, talk to faculty about that and ask them what they think of that. Are there any faculty who want to speak to that here today? No? Okay. Um, for OA journals, other than the ones that we're talking about for the public, um, where, where we're talking about people putting it into public um, 
repositories because uh, one of the pieces of the legislation is trying to decide where should these articles go. NIH has PubMed and some people are thinking well maybe we'll go with another PubMed type model and in fact um, many people in libraries and other fields are suggesting they use something similar so they're not reinventing the wheel and all of these agencies are not coming up with their own plan and they won't be interactive. Also it'll make it easier on people who ask for funding to understand what the process is, if they have a similar process. So um, everyone is curious about how that is going to work out. And also there are questions about where would this um, information reside. And in some cases it might reside in a single um, uh, repository like PubMed, but maybe called something else for other uh, disciplines, um, or will it, or will these authors be putting their um, their articles in the institutional repository? Like we have Digital Commons here, so our faculty has the ability to publish their articles in the Digital Commons and make them available. So, it's not required. We don't have a mandate, no. Um, but it, we, you know, we. We mention it to faculty that it, they can do it. And today, um, almost all publishers actually make it a possibility for the authors. Usually when an author writes an article, um, they get an agreement they have to sign at the end. And the agreement gives all the rights to the publisher. So they lose their copyright uh, there, and they give it to the, the publisher. And so this is um, a way to, they can add an author addendum now, asking for most of their rights and just giving the publisher the right to publish. So yes, I mean, it's certainly something that they can do. And we're talking about that on campus more and more, making, making um, authors aware of it. Yes. Federally, in a different people, way. In the open uh -huh. access movement, having an opinion on if that should be included in open access across the board as well, or is that changing at all? I think it's a different animal in that regard because even though we're paid by the state, it isn't all state funding. It's sort of hard to break out all the pieces that pay for everybody's salaries. So. Um, but yes, in a way, it is uh, the taxpayer, you know, whether they're a student or, or in other ways that we're paid through the state. Um, there are actually states right now uh, that are coming up with their own OA legislation, and so they're encouraging um, that to happen within, within particular states and asking for, uh, I think it was California, and I'm not sure of the other state. Um, there's a couple of more states that actually are asking for the public universities to create repositories. And in many, in many cases, the universities already have them. We have one. But, you know, it's, it's something that is um, bigger than just doing that. Uh, because, you know, faculty publishing is very much keyed into, at this point in time, where they publish and the impact of those articles and who cites them. You know, that's very important to them um, in the current publishing um, situation. But what we're seeing in a lot of discussion is about changing that system and how that system might change to fit with the technology that we have available to us. And you know, years ago, it had to be done differently. And sometimes we're following the same models using new technology, but not really using the technology the way it could be used. And not that you know, we're asking for everybody to um, evaluate scholarly research, but people who can evaluate it, um, they're thinking of making it a more open uh, peer review system. So that there's experimentation going on and a lot of positives that we're seeing, but there, there are always some negatives that are happening at the same time. One of the thing that people you know, think that it costs nothing to publish, but it does cost for certain kinds of overheads that they need to take care of. So there are um, ways that open access um, journals that are not just a repository like PubMed, how they exist. And there are all different ways that they're paid for. 
So um, it, one of the ways that we're working with right now is author publication fees on campus. We just started an, uh, an author publication fee fund. And for um, FIU authors who are faculty or doctoral candidates to ask for some help to pay those fees. The OA um, grants that are put out by these agencies will include that amount of money in the grant. So if someone is publishing with a publisher that has an author, an author publication fee, then it's part of the grant. So that's one of the pieces of the new grants and how they will come out. And some already, the NIH grants are including that kind of thing. But most people, are, I believe, are publishing in PubMed, so it's not a big issue. But depending on your field, it might, it might be. And one of the things that um, is being written about, there's this great article by um, uh, someone named David Lewis about the inevitability of open access. And I, I can honestly tell you that I think it is, seems like it's going to be inevitable in many ways. Um, but they, he's, he was writing about how it's a disruptive innovation. And everyone's talking about disruptive innovations. I think the internet was probably one of our biggest disruptive innovations because lots of different businesses went by the wayside because of the internet. Can you think of one that used to exist that really doesn't exist anymore? Blockbuster. What? Blockbuster. Blockbuster. Anything else? Travel yes, travel agencies. I mean, nobody goes to a travel agent anymore, or practically nobody, um, to make all their plans. And so disruptive innovations, um, he, he um, gives you two characteristics that make up um, a disruptive innovation. And one is the application of new technology using a new business model. So OA kind of fits that. Um, and make it possible for customers who had not been able to access a service or product to acquire it. <coughs> and OA definitely does that. Because if you're not at a university where you have access um, and you know, you guys have to sign in from home to show that you're a legitimate user. Um, those paywalls are very uh, strong. So this, having access through open access, means that a lot more people will have access to research, including you guys, of course. So um, I guess I would ask, you know, is open access a disruptive innovation? When we talk about gold OA journals, these are journals that are that are produced and considered open access, that they're, they're just in an open access um, model. They're not the traditional uh, model. Uh, they don't incur the costs associated with protecting content. So you know, when a publisher has to protect their content, that costs money for them. And that's one of the reasons the prices get so high. Um, and they avoid costs associated with subscriptions because they're not negotiating licenses. They're not billing customers. They're not marketing for sales. They're just, you know, someone goes out there on Google Scholar and looks it up and it pops up. So they don't have to do that. Um, they provide free access linking sharing to customers and they provide exposure for authors. So this is a whole different ball game. And, um, and whether it's a disruptive innovation or not, I guess I'll let you decide what you think. Yes. Yes, uh, it's disruptive um, because it, it triggers the whole free rider problem. And uh, in economics, the free rider problem is when uh, many can benefit off of not paying for something. The public good usually is a free rider problem. This is totally and uh, falls in that category. Yeah, it does. Um, and it goes against uh, big business. <laughs> That's right. It, well, I hate to say it goes against big business in, in certain ways. But big business, you know, has a lot of ways to make money, and they're usually pretty good at figuring out how to do that. I would, I would assume that, that the publishers are spending a lot of time thinking about other ways to make it work. And I don't think, and I know that the U.S. government does not want to injure the publishing um, industry at all. They want to try to find a way to do this where uh, they still have um, some of their previous model. But um, I guess we're just going to wait, have to wait and see. Yes? I had a question about the data that you posted um, that it's grown four times uh, the speed of the inflation rate. In two decades. Um, does demand also grow at that rate? Or it's similar to it? Does no. demand for, uh, as, as far as memberships are concerned? Probably not. You know, universities 
want certain resources and they are required to um, have certain resources for accreditation. So that's not unusual. But no, I mean, think about it. We didn't, we didn't have, well, I'm not going to talk about, I don't know about the private online universities, but it wasn't, they don't collect the same way. So I'm thinking they probably, the demand didn't grow in that area enough to warrant the um, increases. Yeah, definitely. Any other questions? I don't wear a watch. What time are we at here? Oh, so we're getting kind of close to the end. Um, any other questions? Um, for repositories like PubMed, mm -hmm. do they show up on university library sites? If I go on, on FI libraries and search for a term, those types of, of repositories of open are, are yes. there? Yes. Yes. In fact, when you're doing research on our databases and you click the Find It at FIU button to see where that article is, I'm not sure all of you realize that when you're in a database and, it's, and they have that little box that says click for full text, that you really shouldn't click it. Um, the reason you shouldn't click it is that that database, when you do it, they're only looking at full text in that database. And we actually added some software that you see this little find it at FIU icon next to the articles. When you go, if you don't click that box, when you click find it at FIU, a, another uh, window opens up and it tells you all the places where we have it accessible to you. So sometimes another database that we subscribe to has that journal as part of it. And so we kind of we send you there and then you can get it full text. But you'll also notice if, you, if you're looking for open access Ven venues that they will also come up in that list. When you go to get article, it could be from an open access um, uh, place like, like Biomed Central or PubMed. So yes, it's a part of, of all of the things that we look at. We also pull away for you guys. Absolutely. Any other questions? Well, I don't know if you want me to keep going or if we want to call it a, a day. It's up to you. The sting operation. Oh my gosh, how I could put it in a nutshell. Um, the sting operation. Well, a guy named, I think his name is John Bohannon. He created this scholarly article, and he and he um, sent it out to journals. And I, and honestly, I couldn't, I didn't memorize the number of journals, but a significant number of journals. And it was accepted by a, a considerable number, but some of you know some journals absolutely said no. You know they looked at it, their peer review looked at it, and they didn't want to touch it. But um, some that we would consider reputable, a, a few actually even bit and and um, accepted the article. The whole article was a bogus article, and so as he as as it, the, all of the things I've been reading say, if you had any chemistry background, you would have picked it up right away. But apparently, whoever they were giving it to for peer review was not. So it created a huge stir because um, you know you want to believe that the publishers that you're going to are reputable. And actually, there are ways to figure out if a publisher is a reputable publisher. There are a couple of organizations that we, you can go to, like DOAGE, which is a directory of open access journals. You can go to them and look and see if a publisher is there, if a journal is listed there. And then there's a, a, a site that, um, that lists predatory publishers. And you can look there to see if the journal is there. So most of us look there before we would recommend to somebody to publish in a particular journal. Well, what also, so what happened was, um, obviously there was a whole bunch of hullabaloo about this. Science published the sting talking about the article that was sent around and how many open access journals had done it. And it was a very small amount compared to the 10,000 journals that exist, but still it was, you know, uh, a, a considerable number enough to really um, be a sting, sort of. But what was really weird, I mean, when I was reading the article, I was thinking he chose, what he did was he chose a bunch of open access journals that are in DOAGE, and he chose a bunch of journals from this predatory publisher list, about a third of them, I think. And so, he was already going to bad publishers. So I couldn't figure out why he put such a huge number in his study. I'm still trying to figure that out. And, um, 
And I think that the point he made in a, in a strange way was for people to be careful that they shouldn't just publish anywhere just because <coughs> a publisher accepts, they shouldn't just send it to anybody because you don't know if they'll accept it. If they're not, they don't have very high standards, they might. Um, so using some critical thinking before you go and do that, you know, you can always come see a librarian for some help on that. Um, and it also, you know, made people think twice. I, I think they're trying to, you know, hurt the open access environment, but really it didn't hurt it as bad as I, I think it, it, it was meant to because um, it did make people open their eyes. Like Doage, which is very well respected, they have certain criteria for putting a publication in their, in their uh, database. Um, they had already, be, with their normal way that they go over their list of, of publishers, they'd already gotten rid of some of these before the sting came out. So that was sort of an interesting thing. And then once the sting came out, they got rid of every publisher that was on that sting list. And, um, and those publishers would have to, once again, prove that they're, they're reputable. And so, um, so I think that it really put everybody else on their toes. Because for the most part, the whole point of OA is such an altruistic, egalitarian endeavor to make information available to everyone globally. And um, you know, it's unfortunate that, that they had to go to that degree to make that happen. So. Any other questions? Well, I hope that um, you might participate in some of our OA activities this week. And please, if you have questions, contact me. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.